Hey everyone, how's it going? It's been a really long time since I've done a catch em all video, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do with this one. Generation 5 is where the game starts adding a ton of Pokemon. There are 152 non-mythicals added in black and white alone. And the interesting thing about these games is that the only Pokemon you can catch before the post game are the new Unova Pokemon. So I'm going to do something a little bit different in this challenge. Rather than just talk about generally speaking what you can and can't catch, I'm going to take you through my playthrough of trying to catch every single Pokemon. Black and White may have been the most fun I've ever had catching Pokemon. You can catch a ton of them without having to evolve, and I almost played this like, I don't want to say a speedrun, but I tried to be as efficient as possible. Always leveling up Pokemon that need to evolve, always catching Pokemon I need to add to the decks, and it went really, really well. There's a lot of Pokemon to cover, so let me take you through what it's like to catch every single Pokemon in black and white. And of course, we'll handle black to white to, and then the national decks in future videos, assuming this one does well. So if you want to like and subscribe, I know to keep making these because I honestly don't think people really want to see catch em alls anymore, but if they do, here's one. Now, as per usual in the Pokemon series, you cannot get all three starters. So I had to make a choice and I picked Oshawott. I mean, I think it looks adorable and I typically pick the water starter. So that's one Pokemon added to my Pokedex. After battling my rivals, I then head to Route 1, and there are two Pokemon you can catch at 50% odds each, Lillipup and Patrat. Neither of these Pokemon need to be evolved, but we can get them out of the way and bring our Pokedex counter to 3. Next, we're going to head to Route 2, and we're going to catch Purloin. It's only 20%, but trust me, those odds are going to look pretty good later in the game. Now, we're actually almost ready to battle the gym, but there's one more Pokemon we're going to catch, well, technically receive, and that Pokemon is Panseer, one of the elemental monkeys. The rest of them can be caught, and they evolve using evolutionary stones, so once again, it's not a Pokemon we're actually going to use in battle, but we can get it out of the way. Now, against Silent, ideally, we would just use Oshawott. Unfortunately, Silent uses Pansage, which is really bad for Oshawott, and I could just level it up more, but there's really no reason to. We are trying to go fast, so I am just going to use Panseer, this is why you even get a Panseer, to defeat the Pansage. Sure, we don't need to give it experience points, but honestly, if we're trying to be as efficient as possible, I think this is a good way of doing that. Alright, after getting the first badge, we can head to the Dream Yard and catch some Pokemon we've missed, including Audino. So the thing with Audino, although you can't see it here, in this game, a unique mechanic is Rustling Grass. So I actually didn't even know there was Rustling Grass. I was trying to catch a Mana or Muna. But when the grass is rustling, depending on what route it is, you can get a rare Pokemon. Usually Audino, but sometimes fully evolved Pokemon, which we are going to catch. Because in theory, it's faster than having to train a bunch of Pokemon to like the level 30s. And while I'm not going for a Living Dex, just because it's really annoying to do that, it is kind of cool to have as many Pokemon in the box as possible. So we're going to catch Audino, and then once we do that, we're going to catch Mana. Next, we make our way to Route 3, and there's a couple Pokemon we can catch here, but I'm just going to catch Pit of. We'll catch the Blitzel later. That brings our total up to 8 Pokemon, and we're going to make it 9. Oshawott is going to evolve into Dewat at level 17. Thank goodness this isn't a Professor Oak's challenge. That would just seem so tedious to have to get it all the way up to like the high 30s. But we are going to have to evolve it into Samurott. We can just do that a lot later. All right, so now that we have Duat, we can proceed to Wellspring Cave. There are a couple Pokemon we can get here. We can both catch Wubat as well as Rog and Rolla. And Wubat is important because it's one of the first Pokemon that we actually need to train ourselves. Of course, we've been training our Oshawott, now Duat. But Swubat is not available to be caught. The only way to catch one is to evolve Wubat. So Wubat is going to start having to battle trainers along with Duat. And then we're going to head back to Route 3. We're going to catch Blitzel now. And we can head to Necreen City, which has the second gym, Lenora, who has normal Pokemon. Before we battle her, though, we can go to the outside of Pinwheel Forest and catch a couple Pokemon. While Timple can't really help us, Sock might if we need it. After battling all the trainers here, I then catch Timber at level 14. And then it was time to catch Throw. 
So here's the thing about catching throw. It's only catchable in black version with rustling grass. And I want to catch as many Pokemon within one version as possible. That was something that was very important to me because it would be pretty easy to just trade one in from white version like we will for other Pokemon. But the way rustling grass works is essentially the strategy is to just run back and forth, back and forth, and then the grass will rustle. Now, in order to not get encounters as you run to the patch of rustling grass, you're going to probably want to use repels. Ideally, you find a place to run where there isn't any grass, just around a bunch of grass. Then you use the repel as you enter the grass, so you save up your repels. Unfortunately, this process of running around to get the grass to rustle and then looking for a low percent encounter, it can take a really long time. Thankfully, this one only took about 15 minutes. We encounter Throw. Throw's actually pretty powerful, so we had to be a little bit careful, but thankfully, we were able to catch it. Now, against Lenora, thankfully, Duat is pretty high level, so we can just use it, even though Lenora is kind of difficult, I find, in some challenge runs. This, of course, wasn't a challenge run. The goal isn't for the gyms to be difficult. It's trying to beat them while maximizing our experience points, which isn't what we did against Silen because we had to use Panseer, so ideally, we only ever use Pokemon we want to evolve, and Duat is one of those Pokemon, like we mentioned. Woobat is going to be another one, but it just doesn't have a good matchup here, so Duat it was. Alright, with two badges, we're going to catch a whole bunch of Pokemon now that we can enter Pinwheel Forest. We're going to catch a Venipede, which is actually the least likely to catch, that's pretty cool. Sawaddle, Cottony, and although I didn't have to, in Rustling Grass, you can actually catch Whimsicott. You can get a Sunstone later in Nimbasa City, but truth be told, I wasn't actually going for Whimsicott. You can catch the Elemental Monkeys here, but it didn't work out for me, so I'm going to catch them later. Still, Whimsicott is a Pokemon we want, and that's 20 Pokemon registered in the Pokedex. The next Pokemon we're going to catch is a Petlil. Now, Petlil is a white exclusive in the grass, but you can make an in-game trade for a Cottony, and thus you can just catch a second Cottony. And there you go, 21 Pokemon in the books. Now, it was a while before I could catch more Pokemon. I decided to do everything I had to in Castellia City, including battling Berg, the Bug-type trainer. And remember I said Wubat didn't have a good matchup against Lenora? Well, it has an excellent matchup against Berg, because it knows Air Cutter. It still isn't a perfect matchup. It can potentially lose, especially to the Dwebble, but we have Duat to help it out. And so between the two of them, because Duat doesn't have a good matchup against Levani, it's pretty easy to defeat Berg and gain a whole bunch of useful experience points. Alright, next we proceed to Route 4, and there are three Pokemon to catch here. All of them are fairly easy to catch. Darumaka, Scraggy, and Sandile. Now, you can catch a Krokrok and a Dormanitan, but you can't catch Scrafty. So Scraggy will be the third member of our team, and will help provide some decent coverage. There are a bunch more Pokemon to catch in the desert. Maractus in the desert resort. Sigilyph, which can only be acquired in the deep sand, which is a little annoying to move in. Then you can get Dwebble and head to the Relic Castle and get Yamask. I should note that for a bunch of these, repels can be useful to make sure you get the exact Pokemon you want. But in battling all the trainers and catching these Pokemon, it really didn't take me too much time. I can then proceed northbound to Nimbasa City, go to Route 17 where I caught a Gothita, and then I kind of got sidetracked a little bit, but it was to catch more Pokemon. I had forgotten to go back to Pinwheel Forest because there's an area that an NPC blocks until you defeat the gym in Castellia City, and there's some Pokemon we can catch there. Actually, there's two Pokemon we can catch there, a Swadloon and a Whirlipede. After catching those, I can head back to Route 16, where I can catch the remaining Pokemon, Lipard, Minchino, and finally, everyone's favorite garbage pile, Trubbish. In addition, there are a bunch of trainers on Route 16, and after hitting level 30, our Woobat is finally able to evolve into Swoobat. I haven't been showing many of the trainer battles, but right now, I've just been using Woobat and Duat, and part of me was kind of sad to see it finally evolve, because that meant we couldn't use it anymore, since there was another Pokemon that required those experience points. Honestly, it was kind of cool to play the game this way. I never could have a consistent team. It was always shifting up, 
and trying to make it as efficient as possible, honestly, it was really fun. Now, Route 16 also connects to Lost Lorne Forest, and we spent a very long time in here. Lost Lorne Forest has the remaining elemental monkeys, and they can take a really long time to get. It also has Levany, which I did manage to catch in between Panpour as well as Pan Sage. And thankfully, just like Pan Seer, we just need the evolutionary stones, so we don't need to train any of these Pokemon. Also, I caught a Tranquil earlier, so our total is now up to 39 Pokemon, and we're about to get our 40th. You see, another Pokemon I can catch in here is Unpheasant at 5%, and obviously this was going to take a really long time. In the meantime, we encountered a lot of Panseers, and Dewat was really close to level 36, so I just couldn't help myself. I had Dewat evolve, and so now we're going to need an entirely new team, because our Dewat is a Samurott, and no longer should be getting more experience points. It took another 15 minutes, but we did finally find that level 22 Unpheasant, bringing our total to 41. I then head to Route 5. There are a couple Pokemon we need to catch, but we also need to level up our Scraggy, because right now it's the only Pokemon that needs levels. That's going to change pretty soon, but for now, it's the only one we actually have to evolve. Now, potentially, I could have caught Chinsino here, but there is an easier place to catch it, the Pokemon I actually needed was Emolga, although funny enough, I ended up going back to Route 16 because you can get it there in Rustling Grass and it's just a little bit easier. Regardless, that was the only Pokemon I really had to get before we battle Elisa. Now, I did look pretty hard for the Chinsino, so my Scraggy is pretty high level. It's level 33. Unfortunately, it didn't really help all that much since Emolga is a terrible, terrible matchup for it. So, I still do have my own Emolga, as well as Samurott and Swoobat, which can help, although none of them are really good matchups for this team whatsoever. And Elisa proved to be pretty difficult. In the end, even though it was a bad matchup, it was Samurott that helped me out. Like with Silen, we ideally wouldn't use a Pokemon that didn't need more experience points, but as of now, there's only one that does. That's going to change pretty soon, but it's honestly not the biggest deal. Better to just get the win. Now, one way it changed is I actually made a small mistake. Not a big deal, but there was another Pokemon we could have been leveling up. A Tortuga. In Relic Castle, which I already went to, you can get one of the fossils. I picked the Clover Fossil, which works out because we're no longer going to be using Samurott. I don't have the HM for Fly yet, so I have to head back to Nimbasa City by walking, but I can revive the fossil and get a Tortuga. Alright, time to head back to Nimbasa City. We can now go to the Driftvale Drawbridge, and on the drawbridge you can actually catch a Ducklet, so we're gonna go and do that. Once we get to Driftvale City, there are a bunch of routes we can get to, a bunch of Pokemon we can catch. We can head to Route 6 and catch Deerling. It's springtime, so we could catch Vanillite here, but there's no need to change seasons, which is something you can do quite easily in this game. We're gonna head to the Cold Storage just south of Driftvale City, and here we can catch a Herdier, as well as a Vanillite. And in the Rustling Grass, you could even catch a Stoutland, which I do. And I even get that Chinsino that I was looking for before. Those are two Rustling Grass 5% encounters, and we got them both out of the way. Pretty awesome. Those are all the Pokemon I'm going to catch before I battle Clay. And although Clay is the ground type gym leader, Tortuga does have water moves and a high defense. Unfortunately, it's not going to be able to get through the entire battle on its own. Palpitoad knocked it out. But don't worry, that just allowed Scraggy to knock out the Palpitoad, get a Moxie boost, and then knock out Excadrill, which is part Steel type. A pretty easy battle and perfectly efficient. Unfortunately, as helpful as Scraggy was, it's almost time for it to retire. We're going to head back to Route 6 and catch Carablast. This is the first time I get a critical capture, a mechanic introduced in Generation 5 where the ball only shakes once and then the Pokemon is caught. The more Pokemon you've registered in your Pokedex, the higher chance you have of getting a critical capture. I won't point out every time, but I'll try to point out when I got them. You feel pretty good. Trust me, 
This was being played at single speed on an actual console, which is why the graphics look so poor. I didn't realize how to capture footage from a DS. I can actually get much nicer footage as you're gonna see. But the point is, after all these hours getting a critical capture, it's a nice reward. Game Freak was pretty smart there. Anyway, there are some trainers to battle here, and before I even catch Fungus, spoiler alert, Scrafty will become my 51st Pokemon. I then will catch Fungus. After that, however, we enter one of the most catch-heavy sections of the game, Charge Stone Cave. And not only is it catch-heavy, but most of these Pokemon need to actually level up in order to evolve, so we're going to go from a team of one or two Pokemon to a team of five or six. The Pokemon we're going to catch in here are Joltik, which needs to level up to become Galvantula, Ferrisseed, we need to level it up to become Ferrothorn, Tynemo, which we need to level up in order to become Electric and Electros, and Clink, which we also need to level up into Clang and Clink Clang. So we have a pretty full team now. There are three more Pokemon I get in Charge Stone Cave. The first is Boldwar, which I get a critical capture. The second is actually not a Pokemon I catch, but Caracosta. The Tortuga finally evolved. I say finally, but you guys have barely seen Tortuga. But there are tons of trainers here. Don't worry, we have a ton of new Pokemon to use against Skyla. And finally, in many caves in this game, there are these dust clouds and you can get gems or Drillbur. And we got Drillbur. 59 Pokemon before we battle the 6th gym. Not bad. After we finally finish up with Charge Stone Cave, we're not going to battle Skyla just yet. We're going to head to Route 7 and we're going to catch a Watchog, which is why we didn't need to use Patrat all this time. There are a ton of trainers to battle, which is part of why I don't want to battle Skyla yet. Might as well level up, and there's some more Pokemon to catch. On Route 7, there's a Celestial Tower, and there we can catch a Litwick. We actually have to use this Pokemon because you cannot catch Lampent or Chandelure. We then catch Zebstrika, which is why we didn't have to use Blitzel. And we can also catch LGM, which I'm not sure if we're going to level up because BEM is available, albeit on Route 14 in the post game. So I'll think about that one. Anyway, we've caught a ton of Pokemon, and our team looks pretty different as we battle Skyla. Thankfully, most of our Pokemon are either Electric or Steel-type, so we can use kind of anyone we want. She leads off with Swoobat. Oh, I miss Swoobat. And we lead off with Clink, because it has a pretty good matchup against it. And even though I was planning on using some of my other Pokemon in this battle, Clink ended up sweeping Skyla's entire team, which is pretty cool. I've never used Clink before, really. So seeing it absolutely destroy, and it's not even overleveled, it's one of the coolest things about doing this run. With that said, one Pokemon you guys really haven't seen is our Joltik. It has been knocking out Pokemon behind the scenes. However, I didn't get to show it off at all, and now it's evolved. So we have Galvantula. A few minutes later, our Clink, which you did see, is also going to evolve into Clank, although this time we don't have to deposit it because we still need to evolve it into Clink Clank. So, Clink Clank and Clink Clank fans, what a weird name, rejoice. After beating Skyla, we can proceed to Twist Mountain. There aren't too many Pokemon we actually have to catch here. One of them is Girder, who we're going to catch. And it's at this point we do our first seasonal shift. This is really, really easy to do. You can see I'm playing on a 3DS. I didn't have a DS that could output footage at this time. But anyway... We need it to be winter time. The game doesn't actually mirror the seasons of real life. It works on a four month cycle. So January, May, and September all count as winter. And during the winter, the map changes and what Pokemon can be caught changes, including Cryagonal, which we can catch in Twist Mountain, as well as a Cub Chew. I then needed to change the season to summer so I could head to Asira City and access the puddles. They are frozen in the winter. And there's some Pokemon I need here. I mean, technically, you can also catch them on Route 8, but the three Pokemon we're going to catch are Shelmet, Palpitoad, and Stunfisk. All of them are acquired by just running around in these puddles, and being to actually able to catch Pokemon within a city not having to surf is pretty rare, actually, within Pokemon games. 
Then just north of Asira City, there is some grass, which is technically part of Dragon Spiral Tower, but really just outside of it. And you can catch a Mian Fu, one of the best Pokemon in the Little Cup format. And like LGM, although I cannot get its evolved form before the post game, I've decided I am going to hold off and catch them instead of having to train these guys up. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, I started on this run years ago, but I remember this. The next Pokemon I wanted to catch was Seismitoad. 5% encounter rate with rippling water, the same sort of thing as rustling grass, just in the water. Plenty of place to run around, should be easy, right? This took me over two hours. Two hours! That is a long time for a Pokemon that's supposed to appear 5% of the time. So, this made me question whether just catching every Pokemon was worth it. Should I not just evolve my Palpitoad? Didn't matter. Once I was committed, I was committed. And I wasn't going to stop until I caught the Seismitoad. I'm pretty sure that's the last Pokemon we need to get via the Rustling Grass mechanic. Overall, wouldn't recommend. Not as bad as something like Spiritomb. But the one thing I will say that you do need to know is that these numbers are in real time. I played this on a legit 3DS. No speed up. So every battle, every time, it was just another Stunfisk. Ugh, it took a really long time. Anyway, after finally catching the Seismitoad, I was able to battle some more trainers and thus evolve some more of my Pokemon. The first was Litwick, who I haven't been able to show on screen yet, but I did evolve it all the way into a Lampent. And then Ferrisseed, who also I haven't really shown yet, evolved to Ferrothorn, so unfortunately we won't really get to show it off at all. The gym leader in Asira City is Bryson, the ice type gym leader. Interesting how in two consecutive generations the seventh gym leader is an ice type gym leader. But we have a Pokemon that's really good against ice, Clang. Clang's moves are super effective, and Clang resists ice type moves, so it was able to somewhat easily sweep through Bryson's team. And it didn't quite yet evolve, so we're going to be able to use it just a little bit more, which is kind of cool. Now after we defeat Bryson, we're going to change the season back into winter because there's a few ice Pokemon we can catch only in the winter time. In the winter, you get access to the dark grass. Sometimes Pokemon appear in double battles, but you have to knock one out in order to catch. And we're going to catch three different Pokemon, bringing our total to 78. We're going to catch a Vanillish. We're going to catch a Sawsbuck in its winter form. And we're going to catch eventually a Bear Tick. We're then going to finally enter Dragon Spiral Tower, and there are two Pokemon we want to catch here. One of them is Golit, the ground ghost Pokemon, and the second is Drudigan, which doesn't evolve, so we're not going to use it, but we're over halfway done. 80 Pokemon registered. This is going really well. Since we defeated Bryson, we now can use Surf outside of battle, and there's really only one Pokemon you can get via Surf in most places, Basculin, so we're just going to catch one of those. And once we make our way through Dragon Spiral Tower, N will awaken either Zekrom or Reshiram, depending on the game you are playing. And that means we can head back to Relic Castle and catch a Cofagrigus. Another Pokemon we can catch on the lower floors is Crocorock. Now, we will actually need to use Crocorock because you can't catch a Crocodile. So it's going to join our team pretty soon. You can see I'm using Golet. It also has been added to my team since you can't catch a Golurk. And our team's looking pretty good, to be honest. We're going to need a decent team because we're going to have to face the Elite Four pretty soon. There's only one gym left. Before we do that, however, we can actually catch our first legendary Pokemon. And with all the battling I've been doing, Crocorock is actually going to evolve into a Crocodile. So we're barely going to see it used. The legendary we can catch is Cobalion. It's available near Mistrelon Cave on Route 6, but we need Surf, which we now have access to. Now, Cobalion is pretty difficult to catch like most legendaries. I recommend using Dusk Balls. Most of the legendaries are in caves. And if not, just switch to nighttime. In later generations, Timer Balls are pretty good, but they take a really long time to be better than Dusk Balls. But those are the two types I recommend to catch legendary Pokemon. It's usually not too bad. I actually almost forgot to catch a Pokemon here. I have to catch Axu. We don't have to level it up, but we will have to level up its evolved form Fracture, which we're going to catch a little bit later. 
Now, we're at 86 Pokemon, and we're close to the end of the game. So if you thought, gee, there must be a point where the catches start coming fast and furious, that's the point we're at now. In the next two hours, we're going to catch over 15 Pokemon. First, I head back to Driftvale City, not only because it has amazing music, but also because I can catch two Pokemon here in Rippling Water, Alamomala, which should be just an evolved love disc, but somehow isn't, and Jellicent, the evolved form of Frillish, who I actually end up catching after Jellicent because I want to do the Rippling Water catches, which are more annoying, before just the regular Surf catches. Now, a while ago, I actually caught Whirlipede, which I did need to evolve, but it's not a very good Pokemon, so I wait till the end because I have access to Lucky Egg, and I can swap train it, and eventually I am able to evolve it into a Scolipede. I actually got the experience by battling trainers on Route 9, just outside where the 8th gym is, and we're going to catch a couple Pokemon here, a Gotharita, the evolved form of Gothita, as well as a Ponyard, just in regular grass encounters. In the Rustling Grass, we can catch a Gothitelle, and some of our Pokemon need to level up, and we're going to get new ones to use the Elite Four, so this is a good time to do it. So by looking for the Gothitelle, I was able to evolve both my Tynemo into Electric, and I was able to evolve my Golet into Golurk. I then was able to catch the Gothitelle, and shortly thereafter, I was able to catch a Garbodor. By the way, if you're wondering how I'm able to level up so easily when only battling wild Pokemon, it's that the majority of the Rustling Grass Pokemon I'll encounter are Audino, and although they're not quite as good at giving experience points as Chansey, they're pretty darn good, and for the most part, they don't attack all that much or hit all that hard, so it's a very easy way to level up some annoying Pokemon, like Tynemo that isn't very good in trainer battles. Speaking of Tynemo, now Electric, in the mall on Route 9, there is an NPC who will give us a Thunderstone, and we can use that Thunderstone to evolve our Electric into Electross. That is 97 Pokemon, and we're gonna take a little bit of a break now. We have to do some story stuff. To that end, we're gonna battle Drayden. We are using Vanillish, which you guys haven't seen yet. Against the Drudigan, I have to switch to Clang, just because it's not a great matchup. But after Clang faints to Haxorus, I'm allowed to switch back to Vanillish. And although it did get some help from some of the other Pokemon like Scolipede and Golurk, it was Vanillish that finally knocked out Haxorus, meaning we maximized our experience points, but none of our Pokemon evolved, so we can't add to the catch counter. Don't worry, we will do that soon, and it is with a bunch of Pokemon evolving. While you can't simply buy evolutionary stones, there are thankfully enough of them that we don't really need to hunt in dust clouds, which would really, really stink. So we can evolve all the remaining Pokemon that need them, including Chandelure, which needs a dusk stone, Simapore, which needs a water stone, Simiseer, hey, remember from the beginning of the video? It's finally going to evolve using a Fire Stone, Simisage, which evolves using a Leaf Stone, and Lilligant, which evolves using another Leaf Stone. Okay, I know it's a Sunstone, I just wanted to see how many people would immediately go to the comments to correct me, so I got you to comment on the video. Awesome. Now, that's it for Evolutionary Stones, but there are still more Pokemon we need to evolve, like our good old friend Vanillux. We're actually almost at Victory Road. We're on Route 10, where there are some tough trainers and lots of experience points. And because of that, we're not just going to evolve Vanillux, but also, sadly, Clang is going to evolve into Kling Clang, and that means we can't really use it anymore. But it did a really good job. Now, being so close to the end of the game, you might think there aren't that many more Pokemon we're going to catch before the Elite Four, but that's actually not true. There are a ton of them, on Route 10 and in Victory Road. So we gotta go catch a Durant, an Excadrill, which can only be caught in dust clouds. Thankfully, they are 100% in Victory Road. We're gonna catch a Dano. I then head back to Route 10 and catch an Amoongus and a Buffalant. There actually is grass on the way to Victory Road, and it's there which I catch a Vullaby. Outside of Victory Road, we can catch a Heatmore. And remember how I said we didn't have to level up Axu? That's because we also catch a Fracture here. 
That brings our total to 112 Pokemon, and before we battle the Elite Four, there are some other trainers I've left throughout the overworld, especially those on Route 16, where you can get a Larvesta Egg. So we're gonna go and battle them. However, there is still one last Pokemon I need to catch, a Crustle, as well as level up the Pokemon we're gonna be using for the Elite Four. And what Pokemon might those be? One of them is going to be Haxorus. We actually don't need to evolve that many more Pokemon, so we can just use the best of the best. Also, even though it might be easier to do this later, in Victory Road you can catch Terrakion, so we're not going to use it for the Elite Four, but I might as well catch it now. And we're also going to use Zwilus. That's the last Pokemon we actually need to evolve, so even though it's not the best, we do need to use it. Kling Klang, it was amazing, so it's going to be on our team. We didn't really get to see Golurk all that much, but it's at a pretty high level, so it joins the team. And surprisingly, that's it. Because while I do want to beat the Elite Four, they also give a ton of experience points to evolve into Hydreigon. Thankfully, Zwilus has a really good matchup against three of the four Elite Four members. Caitlyn's Psychic Pokemon are a pretty good matchup for its Dark type. Chantal's Ghosts are weak to its Dark type as well. Grimsley does have Scrafty, but otherwise, it's a pretty decent matchup. Marshall's a bad matchup, but we do have Golurk. The fact of the matter is, every time I lose, it's just more experience points to Zwilus, so it really doesn't matter. Eventually, though, I do get a little bored, so I add Vanillux and Chandelure to my team, just to give it a bit more type diversity and to allow me to finally win, and advance to the end stage of the game. We're actually going to catch one Pokemon here. But before we do, I remembered I had rare candies, so we're going to evolve our Swilus into Hydreigon, making the final two battles against Getsis and N a heck of a lot easier. We now don't need to evolve any more Pokemon, so for one of the first times in my entire life, I'm going to be using a Legendary, but not the whole time because Hydreigon is our strongest Pokemon still, and we're going to still see some cameo appearances from Clinklang and Vanillux. We defeat M, we move on to Getsis, and with our fully evolved, super powerful team, we're easily able to win. That takes us into the post game with 118 Pokemon. There are still 34 more to complete the Unova decks. And now that we have access to the whole eastern part of the map, we can catch a bunch of them, such as Musharna. I actually could have caught it in the rustling grass in the dream yard a while ago, but it's much easier to catch in the basement. We can catch a Tornadus, which roams once we defeat the Elite Four. Not too difficult to catch it. Darmanitan, a bunch of Zen Mode Darmanitan are outside a Relic Castle, very easy to catch. I can head to Route 11 and catch a Bisharp. Still on Route 11, we can catch a Mandibuzz. Remember that Larvesta egg I talked about earlier? Well, it's finally going to hatch. Now, I was worried we'd have to level this thing up all the way to level 59, but thankfully you can catch a Volcarona at level 70. Not going to catch one quite yet, mostly because our Pokemon are just too weak. I can head to Marvelous Bridge and catch a Swanna, 100% chance of getting one of those there. I can head to Route 14 and get a Mean Shao. In the Dark Grass on Route 14, you can get a BEM, which is why we didn't have to use LGM earlier. And then, all that's left are three Pokemon. We need to go to Pinwheel Forest one more time to catch Verizion. We need to head to Relic Castle for a third time, because in there you can catch the level 70 Volcarona. And then, finally, we can make our way to the Giant Chasm, and in there, Curum, the 130th Pokemon, the maximum amount you can catch in just one version of black or white. There are still more Pokemon you can get via trading, and these Pokemon aren't too difficult to get. There are some version exclusives like the Rufflet line and the Solacis line. So you can just trade in Rufflet and Braviary. I just traded in Rufflet and then evolved it into Braviary. And funny enough, the game these Pokemon are coming from, remember my Delibird run last year? 
That's why I did that, so I'd have a completed white version so I could trade Pokemon in. I also need to trade in Thunderous. It can only be acquired in white version, and you need both of them in order to get Landorus. Now that we're trading, we can also get all the trade evolutions we need, such as Escavalier and Exelgore, which is, or Excelgur, I don't know. Anyway, you need to trade Shelmet for Carablast, and then they'll both evolve, which is kind of weird. We can also get a Gigalith, which can only be acquired via trading, and same with a Conkelder or Conkelder, not sure how to pronounce that. We can trade in Zekrom, which we've caught in the Delibird run, and that is almost it. We can revive the Plume Fossil and get Arkin, or Archin, not really sure how to pronounce these things. And then the final things I actually need are Snivy and Tepig. Unfortunately, in the Delibird run, I changed my starter into Delibird, so I'm going to have to start a new game, and you actually have to beat the first gym now twice, because the game does not allow you to trade until after you defeat the first gym, which is really annoying, but what can you do? And then I finally need to go through the Elite Four one more time. I'm going to use that level 70 Volcarona and a Venomoth I caught later on in the post game. And then I'm going to equip the Experience Share in order to train my Snivy, my Tepig. Forgot to mention I traded in both Solstice and Duosion, which I evolved into Reuniclus, and my Arcan. And then after battling them again and again, I'm going to be able to level them all up, and I will have completed the Pokedex. Or not. Because for the first time ever, there are two Pokemon that are actually completely left out. No, I'm not talking about Victini, which is a mythical Pokemon you could only have got if you pre-ordered the game. The Pokemon I'm talking about are Zora and Zoroark. They are catchable in Black 2, White 2 version, but in a black and white playthrough, your catch em all total ends at 150. A little disappointing you can't finish the decks yet, but there are a ton more Pokemon we're going to need to catch in the next two versions. I'm not sure if I'm going to do a detailed breakdown like I did for Black and White, or whether I'm going to go back to the more general style I used for the other generations. Let me know which style you'd prefer. We do need to finish the Unova decks first, and then we're going to have our most daunting challenge ever, trying to complete the national decks in Black 2, White 2. These national decks are becoming massive, and this could be really, really tricky. In the meantime, I got plenty